Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Christine Hong. I am the director of the Center for Racial Justice. Um, and along with my co-organizer, Becca Covarrubias, Associate Professor of Psychology, and the members of our planning team, Taylor Ainsley, Domingo Canizales, and Chisa Hughes, I am very pleased to welcome you to the second event in a three-part series that has been organized by the CRJ. The first event in the series featured the heads of the faculty community networking groups, and the last event will take place um, on, um, I'll make an announcement about that at the end of this um, event. Um, both the Institute for Social Transformation and all five divisions co-sponsored this entire series. I also want to acknowledge Chancellor Larive and Associate Campus Provost um, Adrian Brashavanu for their presence at today's very important event. So today's event, Calling Out Whiteness and Structures of University Leadership, will open with Professor Covarrubias and Kat Quinteros offering a research presentation based on their deeply important study, which I hope you've all had a chance to read, Calling Out Whiteness, Faculty of Color Expo Exposing and Reforming Structures of Whiteness and Leadership. This is also posted on the CRJ website. The study examines how faculty of color have experienced whiteness in leadership structures on campus. Um, and this is a campus that has been majority minority in terms of student composition for well over a decade, but remains 67% white in terms of faculty demographics. So their presentation will be followed by action-oriented responses to the report's findings from each of the deans or the representatives, Jasmine Allender in this sequence, Dean of Humanities, Celine Perenias Shimizu, Dean of Arts, Judith Moshkovich, um, Equity Advisor for the Social Sciences, Christina Ravello, Associate Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Physical and Biological Sciences, and Alex Wolf of Engineering. So it is our hope that this event as a much needed space of both convergence and intentionality around the Covarrubias and Quinteros report will give rise to real solutions and shared pathways forward. I want to mention a few ground rules. Um, it's so good to see so many of you. Ron, it's great to see you. You're looking fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's so we have kept this event, which is at 97 people strong, to members of this campus, faculty, staff, grad students, and maybe there are a handful of undergrads here too. We have an open chat. You can make use of it freely throughout today's event, and we will take stock of your questions, and we will collate those as well. Please, um, you know, after during the Q&A period, raise your Zoom hand. Okay, it's really hard for us to see um, your actual hand, but raise your Zoom hand to pose a question or make a comment um, and to limit outside noise. You are not going to be able to unmute during the pr uh, presentations. You will have that capacity, however, during the Q&A. Wow, we are at 101 participants strong. So I'm going to hand things over to, to Becca. Unmute. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm really excited and honored to share space with you today. I'm going to just share some slides so that we can get started um, and make really good use of our time. Um, let me switch this over. Uh, okay, can folks see that okay? Can hear me okay, perfect. Um, so first, just thank you for the opportunity to share some of this important work, um, really the aims to document the lived experiences and everyday resistance of faculty of color leaders here at UC Santa Cruz, but I think represents probably more widely experiences of other faculty of color. Um, the work will also, I think, grounded in my own lived experience stems from a, really a desire to document a collective and diverse set of experiences of faculty of color leaders who are deeply committed to building a racially just institution. 
um, that serves a, demogra a demographically diverse set of students and who navigate, however, structural challenges along that pathway. Um, I wanna note that the talk is brief. The voices we share are also brief and they don't fully capture the beautiful, vulnerable, rich, and sometimes really painful ways faculty of color shared about their experiences. Um, I ask that folks take some time to read the full report, um, which compiles many more voices and experiences of important members of our community and that'll be shared in the link. Um, we share this presentation in gratitude for the time and emotional work that faculty of color participants gave to the project and also in hopes to continue a conversation about how we can make the goal of building a more racially just institution a truly collective one. Um, and so that said, I'm going to hand it off to Kat Gingzettos, who's a third year graduate student in the Department of Psychology and my incredible thought partner in this work. It's been such a joy and pleasure to do this work and to learn from her um, in this endeavor. Oh, thank you, Becca. I'm going to summarize some relevant literature for this work so we all have context and shared language for the project. So first, many universities are serving larger numbers of students of color, first generation students and low income students. Many minority serving institutions are seeing the biggest increase of diverse students. These institutions include Hispanic serving institutions where at least 25% of the student population is Latinx. Yet faculty of color do much of do not match these increasing demographics. So even in disproportionate numbers, faculty of color lead much of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that supports students of color and improves the campus climate. That is, faculty of color help institutions develop a stronger organizational identity around servingness, which is a shift from simply enrolling minoritized students to serving their needs holistically, such as through mentoring and creating new curriculum. Frameworks around servingness are critical as HSI still possess underlying structures rooted in whiteness. Whiteness is a structure that illuminates a hierarchical ordering, ordering of group values, practices, and ways of being. Critical whiteness studies, or CWS, names whiteness as a system of dominance, one that upholds routine practices of whiteness while marginali marginalizing the lived experiences and knowledges of people of color. And this is reflected in leadership. For example, extensive research documents how faculty of color navigate racialized barriers such as invisible labor and a lack of leadership mentorship in university leadership spaces. Most of this work focuses on the experiences of faculty of color at predominantly white institutions. We know less about how faculty of color navigate structures of whiteness in HSIs, where there exists a public mission to DEI in the name of educational equity for minoritized groups. For this work, we draw from perspectives in critical race theory and critical whiteness studies. Critical race theory highlights how varying levels of oppression are linked to historical roots of racism and white supremacy in institutions such as higher education. CRT also stresses the importance of centering and valuing the voices and lived experience of those in the margins, in this case, faculty of color. Finally, CRT outlines the importance of engaging in research that works towards social justice goals. We also drew from critical whiteness studies, which views whiteness as a system of dominance and offers several structural features of how whiteness is maintained. For example, white normativity assumes whiteness as the norm and as such grants a location of economic, political, social, and cultural advantage to those who uphold it. And so ways of knowing that deviate from these norms, such as those of people of color, are considered illegitimate. The exception is when the norms and values of people of color align with the interests and values of whiteness, which aligns with CRT's tenet of interest convergence. Whiteness in the academy in particular is reinforced through epistemic exclusion, which is a systemic devaluation of the scholarship of faculty of color. CWS ties this type of exclusion to a process of epistemic ignorance or a collective forgetting of the brilliance, beauty, and contributions of faculty of color or people of color. Utilizing both CRT and CWS allows us to better understand how faculty of color experience epistemic ignorance or a collective forgetting in leadership. That is, we can examine in which ways do structures of leadership invalidate and ignore the contributions of faculty of color. Indeed, a critical approach to an investigation of whiteness requires an understanding of how such power structures are exposed, challenged, and reformed. What we learned from work on faculty of color's experiences and leadership within a uh, predominantly white institution context is that faculty of color encounter several barriers when navigating a university space not designed for them, such as issues with structural diversity, which is the numerical representation of minoritized people within university leadership. 
faculty of color are underrepresented in leadership roles such as presidents, provosts, and deans. Faculty of color who do obtain such positions negotiate organizational structures and decision-making processes that often reflect a top-down approach. This is an approach where leadership is power-centered, meaning power is held by a few top positions and hierarchical where those at the top have higher authority and status, and status than others. So although shared governance assumes collaboration between administrators and faculty for advancing the goals of the university, common structures of gov governance reflect decision-making practices of those in power who are typically white leaders. Leadership practices that deviate from these current structures are often overlooked, dismissed, or miscategorized. This works by first rendering invisible the labor and contributions of faculty of color who take on an uneven burden of DEI work that sustains the university. Even if these efforts are not formally recognized, faculty of color are still expected to engage in heavy service, teaching, and mentoring. This is particularly the case at HSIs that serve higher numbers of minoritized students who disproportionately seek guidance from faculty of color. Second, this work is also not highly valued as other university activities, such as individual research productivity. The overemphasis on individual outputs over collective campus engagement activities, such as grassroots leadership, is at odds with building a racially just institution. Grassroots efforts include political bottom-up efforts that are linked to advancing the needs of people of color in education. Third, in not recognizing the value of grassroots efforts, little change can happen to reform structures of whiteness. So all of this leads to our current study at UCSD, which is one of only 17 HSIs in the nation that is also an R1 doctorate granting university. This context is critical as faculty of color navigate unique priorities such as balanced leadership efforts in the name of servingness with pressures of meeting standards for research productivity. Yet there is scarce literature examining, examining faculty of color leadership in HSIs that are R1 institutions. We pursued two research objectives, which are, first, how do faculty of color experience whiteness and structures of leadership in an HSI context, and how do their own leadership perspectives and efforts reform such structures? So for the study, we had a diverse sample of 16 faculty of color participants, the majority identified as women, and there was good representation across academic positions, and we had representation across four of the five divisions. Recruitment began fall of 2019, where we reached out to faculty community networking groups whose reports were the focus of the first event in the series. We also used snowballing methods in which faculty of color recommended other possible participants. Next, the PA engaged in semi-structured interviews with participants, which took place in winter and spring of 2020, where most of these interviews occurred over Zoom. We engaged in rigorous coding procedures and steps to ensure credibility for the sake of time though, I won't go over these steps, but we're happy to answer any questions after. All right, so now I'm gonna pass it on to Becca to walk us through the results. Uh, thanks so much, Kat. So we constructed three themes that reflect structures of whiteness in university leadership, and then three themes documenting how faculty of color reform such structures. So I'll share some of those now. Um, so faculty of color gave examples of campus leadership reflecting whiteness and structural diversity. So for example, Dr. D stated, the university is a place um, in which the point of positions are often white men. They could be white women as well. I mean, look at our current leadership right now. And so part of the structuring nature of whiteness is it's taken for granted feature in mainstream spaces. As Dr. J noted that one can go into these rooms where there are 30 chairs and three of them are people of color and it's okay, it's not an outrage. Um, the lack of faculty representation is not an outrage, assumes whiteness as the norm here. Faculty of color also describe how whiteness permeated even decisions about why and which faculty of color are selected into leadership positions. So Dr. D, for example, stated, um, when there is an administrator of color, that person often is not just tokenistic, but explicitly chosen for their supposed apolitical neutral stance. Um, Dr. G, um, Dr. D uh, further suggested that to access these sort of upper level leadership positions that faculty of color at times are expected to assimilate it or play by the rules of the game um, and shy away from some sort of transform transformative change. Um, white normativity, as Kat outlined earlier, details how deviations from whiteness can be rendered um, as illegitimate. And so faculty of color in interviews shared the ways in which their efforts and leadership were in fact invalidated. Part of whiteness, for example, for Dr. H included narrow definitions and review criteria for what constituted service and leadership. She shared, 
Establishing a positive relationship with communities takes time and a lot of effort, and it isn't seen as something that is of direct service to the campus. Some campuses recognize it is important leadership because they've set aside staff positions for it. But in some cases like ours, we don't have those types of resources. Um, so a consequence of sort of narrowly defined metrics is that critical efforts of faculty of color, especially in the realms within diversity, equity, and inclusion, and serving us, become mislabeled or um, devalued or rendered invisible. And because of the work is not fully recognized, um, faculty of color run the risk of um, being asked to do um, more service, right? Because the other forms of activity are not being fully recognized, as Dr. D described. In this way, mislabeling or devaluing current contributions can create disproportionate workloads of labor for faculty of color, which is something heavily documented in the literature. Faculty of color observe that campus leadership function in a top-down, undemocratic manner, including making decisions without engaging the community and without appropriate checks and balances. Dr. B, for example, noted a trend in which campus leaders sent the message that I'm in charge and I don't have to tell you anything. It's alienating. It's telling people that it's uh, aerocratic, you conform or else. Um, you know, what's interesting, there's nuance here, right? Some faculty of color acknowledge the competing demands of campus leadership. So Dr. P, for example, noted that such leaders probably are dealing with a hell of a lot of things behind closed doors. Um, still, Dr. B and others in the interviews argue that the lack of transparency and, uh, and communication from campus administrators, including the limitations that they also confronted in their own leadership positions, created a climate of mistrust and a feeling excluded in important decision-making processes that had direct impact on their lives, but also the lives of students that they were serving. Um, for faculty of color, reforming structures of whiteness, including centering the voices, backgrounds, needs, and lived experience of those on the margins. They viewed leadership as fostering equity and removing barriers for minoritized groups, including colleagues, staff, and students. Dr. O oh described leadership as wanting to pave the way for it to be easier for people of color coming behind you. They wanted their disciplinary fields to be more inclusive and diverse, to be welcoming, and to be a, in a room full of people that look different. Um, consistent with critical race theory, faculty of color importantly linked leadership to social justice that centered the needs and lived experiences of people of color. Faculty of color also engaged in grassroots leadership driven by dedicated people on the ground with a strong commitment to the cause. And what's interesting in interviews is that they acknowledge that grassroots leaders do this work at great personal cost because they believe in this cause. So for example, I'll give um, uh, an illustration with Dr. G who led an intellectual reading group which later transformed into a critical social community space with graduate students of color who experienced the campus as really alienating. Um, she saw the space as important leadership while also recognizing in her own words that none of it is going to count for tenure. She explained this further. I feel like as junior faculty of color, we get told not to do this kind of stuff, um, but I, I can't not do it because this is stuff that makes everything else feel meaningful. So I'm willing to take the hit and I feel like I've managed to, you know, maintain a steady research output so I don't have to worry, but like I just can't imagine not doing this stuff. Um, I think for me, this example highlights how faculty of color build critical retention spaces from the ground up. Um, and are committed to supporting these spaces and also reflects right that mission of serving this, even at the cost of their own personal career advancement or also their well being. And then finally faculty of color leadership examples and perspectives highlighted a notion of collaboration. So rather than centering individual power collective power was used to forward the goals of the group. Um, the benefit for faculty was a leadership model where people build leadership together, as Dr. P noted. They describe leadership as getting shit done in a way that brings people together. Um, faculty of color participants noted uh, importance of three steps in that collaborative governance. So first, faculty of color shared that observation was crucial for leadership. So Dr. P explained this as, let me first get a sense of how your space operates, and then I'll be a leader, um, as opposed to here I am, I'm in charge. Listening was another important facet of collaborative leadership. So Dr. L highlighted the critical need for being able to notice when someone isn't being heard and making sure that they're being heard and talked about the usefulness of these informal conversations to validate the experiences of people's and their frustrations, um, uh, particularly with um, important decision-making processes. And then the final facet of collaborative leadership was adaptation. So part of adapting, including knowing when to leverage one's strengths so Dr. E explained a leader should know what her strengths are and her limitations are. A leader should know when to rely on others' expertise and to trust them. 
So um, the collective voices of faculty of color, I think, call for transformational change to structures of leadership within an HSI context. This need stems from a goal of building a racially just, equitable institution. Um, there are several recommendations that we draw from the faculty of color interviews, but this is also supported by um, theory and research work in this area. So the first is to improve structural diversity. So this can, the shifting of structural diversity can range from hiring more faculty of color to shifting selection processes for who is identified as a leader. So these criteria can include demonstrated evidence of um, efforts to lead, recruit, and, diver and support diverse teams, to advance DEI in concrete ways, and to employ anti-racist and collaborative practices in their everyday work. Um, faculty of color also noted the ways that top-down bureaucratic um, approaches undermine shared governance and transparency. So this is particularly consequential when administrators are handling issues. So for example, like the teaching strike or police presence on campus. And that's important context from which the interviews are actually taking place. I wanted to recognize that. Um, how those issues directly affect minoritized students and the well-being of those supporting those students. So a racially just approach intentionally includes voices and representation of faculty of color and others who have been marginalized within decision-making processes. Um, grassroots leaders should be supported, selected, and empowered. Um, these efforts reflect an approach that is grounded in the daily lived um, realities of members of the institution and also that hold the institution accountable. Um, specifically, these leaders work to um, change underlying structures of whiteness to better reflect an, organi an organizational identity rooted in a mission of servingness. And the reality is that many um, of the leaders who are engaged in this sort of grassroots leadership that can be transformational work outside of formal governance structures, um, which can render their work um, invisible or create disproportionate workloads. So indeed, faculty of color in the project um, felt frustrated in having to explain how their efforts um, met um, evaluation checkboxes or how their community engaged efforts were just as vital as individual research productivity. Um, so one recommendation is that building a racially just university uh, requires a completely new vision of how we evaluate and review the many varied and critical contributions of a diverse set of faculty on our campus. And this was really an underlying theme, I think, across the, around the interviews. Um, and so I'll just sum by saying faculty of color play a critical role in recognizing, representing, and addressing the needs of communities they serve. Um, they bring many strengths to these endeavors, including a commitment to equity and social justice, to grassroots practices grounded in community needs, and to collaborative leadership that fosters consensus building and trust. Um, transforming leadership structures and the systems that review those efforts um, is necessary for acknowledging and lifting the work of faculty of color. Such transformation is critical um, for the retention and success and well being and overall health of faculty of color, but also for the students of color that they serve on campus, and also tremendous for a research intensive public university system aspiring for a mission of serving this. Um, so I just want to briefly thank the collective um, that made the work possible. I wish I had time to outline all the individual contributions because they're immense. But what I'll say instead is that I'm deeply, deeply grateful for being able to connect with our faculty of color colleagues on this project. I don't think I actually would have had the chance to meet some of you if, if it wasn't for some of this work. Um, I did the interviews at a time that I was personally navigating an incredibly difficult leadership experience of my own, and it made me question really my fit here on this campus. And so to be able to learn from and connect with my colleagues is not only healing and validating, but I was just so inspired, I think, by their brilliance and deep commitment to the work. It made me feel like I was part of a collective cause. I think we just have such incredible people here, and I'm so glad to be able to connect with you all from you. Um, but also thank you all for just bringing your time and energy and really sensitive thoughtfulness to this topic. And I'm really um, I'm looking forward to engaging in this conversation further. Thank you. Thank you. And just um, a brief reminder, which is that um, our deans um, and or representatives from their um, from the divisional offices will be speaking in this sequence. Jasmine Allender, Celine Perenius Shinizu, Judith Moshko uh, Moshkovich, excuse me, Judith, I'm sorry, um, Christina Ravello and Alex Wolf. Um, and I also just really want to thank, you know, all the divisions came out right off the bat and they supported um, this entire series and we are so deeply appreciative. Yeah, you know, this, it, it feels like there is genuinely a collective conversation happening right now. Jasmine, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Christine. Thanks to you and Taylor and Domingo and others organizing from CRJ. And thank you, um, Rebecca and 
Catherine for your really important work. So I am Jasmine Allender, Dean of Humanities. I started in August 2020, so this is my second year, and I will take my time um, to go over some of the initiatives that we're working on in the Humanities Division. Um, three particular areas I want to highlight around uh, identity taxation, um, divisional infrastructure for DEI work, and recruiting and retaining diverse faculty. So in terms of um, identity taxation, also sometimes called cultural taxation, you know, what I'm really interested here is in figuring out strategies in partnership with all of you for tax relief. And, um, you know, I, identity taxation is something that we all know exists. There's a lot of data and research behind it, including the Calling Out Whiteness report. Um, when I was at, at a, attended a panel last year organized by the National Humanities Conference on Identity Taxation, um, which featured Tiffany Joseph, who does a lot of the, the research around identity taxation. Uh, it was interesting to me to be with a group of uh, administrators and researchers across the country and coming to the same kind of stumbling block as to you know, not having necessarily a shared set of best practices for how to address identity taxation. So I think, you know, this is um, an institutional problem at, at Santa Cruz, but it's an institutional problem across higher ed and um, something that I'm hoping that we can really um, help address. I've been trying to think about a kind of distinction between formal and informal DEI service. Rebecca, you talked a little bit about this just now in your, in your overview. Um, not a distinction in terms of what should be counted and what should be rewarded, but more formal kinds of DEI service um, are some, sometimes easier to make visible. And what I'm really concerned about is the kind of informal DEI service, the kind of um, uh, mentoring, that kind of community engaged work that you talked about that is um, harder to render visible and therefore becomes even more vulnerable to um, not being valued and supported and compensated. So um, with that kind of thinking, we are working on a DEI service compensation plan for faculty, um, again, you know, in, in, in process and very open to um, ideas and um, critique. The principles or the sort of like key areas of action that I'm thinking about right now are around um, three words, recognize, alleviate, and compensate. And um, those kinds of like organizational buckets is helping um, us think through the kinds of um, actions that we might employ to address um, identity taxation. So for example, recognition, that could come in the, in the form of um, awards for mentoring, for DEI service, or maybe more appropriately ser serving NESS. Um, there should also be a way to report DEI service and personnel review in, in a more meaningful way than we currently do um, around alleviate, creating DEI infrastructure for more formal mechanisms to address mentoring, wayfinding, and community building. We're starting to see some of that with the equity advocates um, that are coming into divisions, and I'm really happy that the VC DEI search is now um, underway. Those are important steps, um, as would be a campus ombuds office, and that connects also to um, the calling out whiteness report that, you know, faculty of color report leadership activities that focus on social justice and on the collective well-being of POC institutions. So that also potentially opens up more leadership positions that would fit that profile. This all connects also with DEI infrastructure. Um, around compensation, we need ways to create mechanisms to reward DEI service. Um, and that's really uh, true for staff as well as faculty. And I really wanna think through ways that we can help faculty and staff make visible this work um, beyond the anecdotal. And now I'm realizing how fast my time is going. So let me go to my second point, creating DEI infrastructure in the division. So um, there's three main sets of inf infrastructure we're working on in the division, DEI infrastructure, research infrastructure, and student success infrastructure. Um, and 
we don't have dedicated infrastructure support for DEI and inclusion initiatives, and that's something that really needs to change. So obviously we will welcome the addition of the equity advocates. Uh, we're creating a new associate dean of DEI position that will be posted internally this spring. This comes after those positions have been created in arts, SOCSI, and PBSI. And we asked in the resource call for um, resources specifically to try and support DEI infrastructure in the division, which includes the associate dean position, but also includes funding awards and other forms of recognition and providing funding for programming, which could include mentoring and leadership training. And those were, um, I think, key things that came up to me in the last um, calling out whiteness event and in the reports, I think the 2019 reports from the different affinity groups is something that we really starkly need. Lastly, I'd like to talk really briefly about um, recruiting and retaining a diverse faculty. In the division, our focus has been really on trying to come up with a divisional strategy to hire UC president's postdoctoral fellows. Um, and that started with some information gathering um, with the heads of the PPFP program, I guess that's redundant, the PPF program, and um, also reaching out to Doug Haynes at UC Irvine, who seems to be very, very good <laughs> at hiring president's postdoctoral fellows. Um, and particularly with the Mellon grant, we're at a moment, uh, I, I, assuming most of you know about the, the $15 million that Mellon is infusing into the UC president's postdoctoral um, program. Um, so it's a particularly important time to be aggressive and take advantage of that hiring incentive. Um, the, uh, I convened the faculty in the humanities division who had been presidential postdocs to come together and talk through strategies. And now we have a subset um, of that group who will be coming up with a, a strategy that's again, division-wide and tied to some of our future hiring plans. Um, in a, in addition, uh, we have been talking across divisions about different cluster hire conversations. I'll leave that there, but we can talk more about that maybe in the Q&A. And finally, it's extremely important to me as a public historian that we are working to more broadly define research and scholarly activity so that it includes public digital and community engaged work. I have more, but I'm gonna stop there because I have used up all my time. So I will turn things to Celine. Thank you so much, um, Jasmine. The um, arts division um, seeks to train the next generation of uh, scholars and practitioners in the arts. Uh, with this in mind, you know, in the year 2045, the United States will be a country where the majority will be people of color and California's demographics already reflect these trends where 45% of the population is Latinx, yet Latinx people have a mere 4% of uh, speaking parts in popular films, according to the Annenberg Studies on Diversity in Hollywood. So this is the landscape in which we are intervening. The arts represent creative industries that are some of the most exclusionary in the world. So the UC Santa Cruz Arts Division enacts an expansive vision that sees the university as the ground where this all changes. It's the site where excellence emerges from equity and innovation can only come from inclusion. We only get better art when it is accessible to all people, especially those who bear histories of exclusion and the suppression of their stories. And for me, I believe we have not yet unleashed the power of art until everyone is uplifted, enabled and supported. And the way to do this is to really engage the pain and suffering inflicted by institutions as an act of resistance undertaken so as to transform these institutions, whether it's the media industries or in education. So for me, under my leadership as the first woman of color dean at UC Santa Cruz, these issues of social equity and the power of empathy through the arts is really coming into sharper focus. And I make sure to do this in our uh, biweekly um, leadership meetings where we confront, you know, through data-driven discussions, you know, who speaks at faculty meetings and what can chairs do to, to make sure, you know, that, um, that we empower uh, faculty across the ranks to participate and that uh, junior faculty are heard. I'm also creating new programs and in institutions such as every third Thursday, we have Cessnon salons where every, you know, unit of the arts division present their latest and greatest research and initiatives. These gatherings celebrate community collectively and 
and uh, remind us of our shared goals. In the fall, we have a convocation that honors a distinguished banana slug. This year, um, it was Kent Nagano, the um, world-renowned maestro. We have a winter retreat that included a keynote by sociology professor emeritus John Brownchilds, who emphasized the practice of respectful listening and respectful speaking as our uh, ethos, our practice. We also did a division-wide uh, DEI workshop that drilled down to our mission as a community. Um, we have a newsletter and a video podcast plus town fora that, that inspire um, energetic, you know, individual contributions, but really uh, underscored by this mission of DEI. And, you know, as the first woman of color uh, dean here, there are a large number of faculty who are talking with me individually about longstanding experiences of racism and exclusion. And for me, it's really a matter of making use of our processes to put on the record these experiences of discrimination and of harassment so that they may be addressed and uh, to transform the institution. Um, and I'm also sending a message that I have zero tolerance for racism that create obstacles for everyone in our community. From, and, and that we need to take advantage of the offices that are in place uh, to help us. There are seven um, key pilot um, enterprises um, that I'm focusing on. The first is I'm requiring every single department, you know, unit in my division to um, write up, uh, implement, submit uh, DEI plans um, that really are grounded in the longstanding exclusions and harms. Um, that have been experienced by members of our community, communities of color on this campus. Acknowledging these histories allow for change and reconciliation, new collaborations and configurations of resources and more welcoming spaces of learning. I want to celebrate the amazing work that's being done. You know, for the past 31 years, Don Williams and the African American Theater Arts Troupe have been doing recruitment efforts in the African American community of Seaside. Carlton Hester, um, music professor and our associate dean of DEI, is you know, working to bring Black Students United of California, their conference in 2023, 400 African-American high school student leaders will be visiting our campus and being introduced to, to this place as a possible intellectual sanctuary for their own future. Um, and in anticipation of the changing demographics of the United States, we are also you know, asking questions about decolonizing the curriculum and whether our institutions of higher education are ready for the needs of a multiracial population and how the curriculum needs to reflect the knowledge inquiries and methods of a global society and the music department is already in their second of a four-year plan in order to do this and the the early data shows that um, it's really benefiting uh, the students higher enrollments and satisfaction as well as you know, introducing more questions. The second project is exposure to excellence and having this vision of an outdoor museum uh, residencies. A recent study on diversity and inclusion from Columbia University shows that exposing people to the excellence of people of color is an antidote to the racist dismissal that's entrenched in our society. So beyond the DEI workshops that we're doing, we need to simply introduce excellent artists of color so as to expose our students to their specific practices processes and concerns. And um, the, uh, the notion of an outdoor museum, you know, is to transform our spaces to reflect the centrality of the experiences of people of color in the history and identity of our university. So this is a major project that really emerges from listening sessions to people of color in our community that uses art to ensure that voices shape our spaces. And this um, is submitted to the chancellor, uh, it's a chancellor driven project. We intend to gather the stories of how policing has intensely shaped our community's lives. We intend for murals, video projection, sound installation and performance to transform our campus, both to acknowledge, you know, the background and histories that our students, staff and faculty bring to our spaces and how we can transform these spaces through our experiences. And it really builds upon, you know, how we define the beauty of this campus uh, to include these experiences. Um, the third thing is to really encourage uh, ch courageous conversations that um, really confront the most challenging issues of our time. And I, can, I, I can't really share um, some of the per that kind of program thing that we're doing right now, but we're being very ambitious and aspirational and bringing together um, uh, prominent speakers from all sectors of our uh, society, uh, government, education, uh, and more. The fourth is um, mentorship across generations. Um, 
so we're working on DEI plans now, and in the next year, we're focused on implementing mentorship plans that will benefit um, our students and our faculty. Um, we also have implemented um, programming such as the arts professional um, pathways where we bring different um, different representatives from all the sectors of the arts and have them into conversation with our students that's happening on April 15. There's a, a very impressive roster of um, guests who are coming and we're organizing and exploiting the, the venue of Zoom in order to have um, even more intimate uh, conversations with these leaders. Um, we also have equity and excellence funds where I'm actually listening to the students to have them let us know what should the university of the future look like. These will be funded. Um, mentorship for faculty in the arts. This is being led by Associate Dean uh, Larry Andrews, who's done extensive and excellent research on best practices regarding mentorship, paying in particular attention to the DEI service of um, faculty. So those uh, mentorship plans are going to be implemented, you know, beginning at the end of the spring uh, forward. We also have a graduate student mentorship program in the arts uh, through the ARI. Um, Holly Unra and more were part, we have a cohort of students who are working with um, creative professionals on charting their careers. The sixth thing is we are developing community partnerships with um, San Francisco Film. We're um, doing an event where we're helping to celebrate uh, Michelle Yeoh and Sandra Oh in conversation and bringing people to, to that event. We also co-sponsored the um, Watson Film Film Festival. You know, it's an amazing investment in regional filmmaking, you know, in terms of this philosophy of really breaking, exploding the adage that the most important art comes from major cities when actually the collaborations that are happening in our programs with the region uh, show a different kind of uh, belief altogether that, that the most relevant art can happen here. Um, and uh, lastly, I'm also redefining what philanthropy um, can look like by diversifying um, our donor pool and putting really at the forefront our DEI efforts as worth um, investment. So in conclusion, you know, the UCSC arts initiatives under my leadership really focus on DEI, really thinking about the new demographics of our nation, how we can be responsible in our relationship to the region, and the context of this irrational and fervent fears regarding, you know, uh, critical race theory, you know, there's such an acknowledgement in my leadership regarding, um, you know, power dynamics and um, really using moments to, to educate ourselves on, on how we can better work together in a more um, inclusive way always remembering that, you know, it's that there's a special power of the arts, you know, to deploy emotion, to develop empathy and uh, compassion for others. And we can lean into our discipline in order to solve these problems. Thank you. Judith? Yes. Yes, I'm just going to share the screen. Whoops, not that one. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just using a PowerPoint to remind myself of um, my thinking. And if um, I'm going to start the time here, give me two seconds to put things where I'd like them to be. Um, so I'm Judith Moskovich. Um, I'm uh, the equity advisor for the social sciences division. Um, I'm uh, happy to be here. Particularly, I just want to say the opportunity to hear what other divisions are doing. Um, it's unusual to, to get to hear across divisions. Um, so I'm just, I'm not going to uh, cover everything or, or report on everything, just a few of the current and future plans from the social sciences um, division. But first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to uh, Rebecca Covarrubias and um, Catherine Quinteros for the report. Uh, we've been thinking about it and talking about it in the social sciences division because you're our own um, since it, it, it came out and as it was in process. Um, I'm also wa really wanting to thank the faculty affinity groups. Uh, their report last time is a lot of what my own thinking and the, the uh, division's thinking has been focused on. And I particularly want to thank the Latinx, Chickenx uh, faculty affinity group. I participated in 
for two years in that group. And for me, it was a place and a space that grounded my own thinking um, on these issues. And again, thank you to the Center for Racial Justice for bringing us together uh, to think through these things uh, together and collectively. So just an overview um, of uh, work in the division, um, what are current and future social sciences uh, division DEI work and leadership positions. I sometimes can't keep track of everything. So um, in, in terms of DEI work in the division, there was a DEI task force or council for one year in um, 2018. Uh, the executive committee is the associate dean, center directors, and the dean serves as an advisory board um, to the dean, uh, often focused on DEI issues. Um, division faculty leadership positions that are related to DEI. Currently, um, there'd be a position of associate dean for DEI. Uh, and right now, again, I can tell you why it's called equity advisor. Um, that's me for the past two years. It'll be associate dean for DEI starting in summer of 22. And I'm also happy to say that there's gonna be a new associate dean for student success um, and retention um, starting in fall of 22. Um, there are also, um, one of the things I wanna say I'm, I'm conscious of and, and trying to think about and, and communicate is that, uh, DEI work happens at many different levels and depends on resources, right? So there's the division, and, and I put this on this slide, but the Senate faculty equity advocates are really from the Senate side, right? The Senate faculty side. So the faculty equity advocates, there'll be two per division. Um, one of will focus on hiring and um, best practices for equitable hiring. And one per division will focus on creating informal informational resources and practices and building community to promote faculty retention and success. Um, it may be, you know, there'll be lots of work to do in terms of the Senate faculty equity advocates. Um, and by the way, this is a, a UC wide um, um, initiative that. Um, Again, we're recently starting here on this campus. Uh, at the campus level, what are the campus level initiatives that are relevant to the issues raised in the report and by the affinity groups? And how is the social sciences division participating? Um, if you haven't heard about this, we, we can tell you more. There's something called a sea change campus initiative. Um, right now it's focused on faculty. Topics have included hiring, retention, promotion, mentoring, workload, many, many other issues. It is sponsored by uh, the AAAS. Uh, for the future, it's a three-year process uh, and there will be consulting and support from the AAAS. Other UC campuses have already embarked on this. Um, and we are, again, doing this as part of um, what the system is doing. <laughs> so, um, the current and future plans from the division, what, what could the division do to address issues raised in the report and particularly by the faculty affinity groups? I was struck, um, I took notes on the affinity groups reports and really appreciated um, the details of everything that they were saying. And there were two um, issues that basically every group um, discussed. Uh, one of them was mentoring, the other one was service and there's, different ways to think about that. Uh, so I'm talking about mentoring of faculty, right? So um, in the conversations we've been having in, in the division with the um, uh, executive committee, um, mentoring of faculty happens in multiple, you know, different places. Um, I've noticed, for example, that there are things that the academic personnel office provides. CIDL has been doing some of that work. There's work at the division, there's work at the department. Um, of course, people are also being mentored, faculty are being mentored by faculties at other UCs, at other universities, and in one's field. So um, I really want us to think collectively about what do we mean by mentoring? What is it that, that we're needing in terms of mentoring. 
So some of it is where to go for information. Some of it is, I want to call it more than mentoring. Um, if we think of mentoring as advice, great, you know, you can get advice, but it's more, I'm thinking in terms of support rather than mentoring. So one of the things I want to mention is if we imagine that faculty mentoring is once again an individual response, and I noticed that in the report, the individual versus collective, right? If it becomes a responsibility of single individuals to be faculty mentors, then we're just recreating the same taxation on those individuals who will step up and, um, and do that kind of mentoring. So the point is to not increase the load for faculty of color as mentors, um, because that's not a solution. And that may be obvious, but I wanted to say that. Um, beyond mentoring, to think about regular consistent support at critical times. And again, this is a lot of the work that is invisible when things happen, you know, at 10 o'clock at night and somebody needs to review or revise their bio paper, their personal statements. This is a lot of the work that people are doing. Um, and um, I'll just mention a couple of the other questions in terms of what does that support look like? How is that support made accessible? What are safe spaces to ask difficult questions? And how, does, uh, new, how do new faculty manage multiple perspectives? What if you're getting contradictory mentoring uh, from different places? So then um, moving on to service, to echo what other people have said, making it visible, documenting, reviewing, um, and I wanna underscore balancing. So the, the division is planning to design activities to again support, not just mentor, um, new and junior faculty, particularly around academic personnel um, issues and processes. We're considering piloting a few activities. One would be a quarterly program for new and junior faculty to ask um, questions. Uh, we're also considering taking some of that and producing short videos since um, a lot of times we don't have time to actually attend uh, places to ask questions. Um, collecting and posting frequently asked questions all in one place in the division so that we can find those. Again, these to me seem like they're, um, might seem like they're simple, but um, sort of organizing the division work that um, supports and mentors faculty in learning how to um, look at service. And um, lastly, how to define service to look at it at different levels, what are the expectations for different uh, ranks? Um, we've only started thinking about the, the balancing, for example, balancing service um, across quarters, across years, across ranks. Um, I've used the metaphor sometimes that it's a relay race, you know, we pass batons. Um, sometimes batons get dropped, sometimes there's nobody there to pass the the baton onto, but that service is really a collective responsibility, um, not individual. And I'm not sure where I am at time, but um, I could tell you all of the things that the division um, has done and continues to do um, in terms of, of DI work, but I won't, I'll just stop um, and focus on this. Again, thank you for the opportunity to hear this across divisions and I'll stop sharing. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Uh, I'm Christina Ravello, Associate Dean of uh, Physical and Biological Sciences, focused on um, DEI work, DEI issues. Um, so, <clears throat> um, in PBSI, we've hosted STEM diversity programs for decades, which are mostly focused on giving students uh, research experiences and in helping them develop their identities and sense of belonging as scientists. These have been going on for decades, like I say. There are, these programs have been relatively siloed, and we're trying to center these programs within the division. And in addition, we're working on projects that would help to center anti-bias perspectives but also seeing that we have a lot of work to do in front of us. And because of the kind of limited time that I was allotted, I decided not to be comprehensive about what we're doing in PBSI, but rather to frame my remarks 
along the lines of what the Covarrubles and um, Quintero's paper recommend about and, and recommends and then and then sort of um, talk about what we're trying to do in PSI related to those recommendations. So the first one is a better structural diversity, particularly within leadership roles. And we don't have enough faculty of color. So certainly we need to increase faculty diversity, changing hiring practices and equity minded training are required. So although these are important, I'm not gonna talk about these today because of the lack of time. Um, and instead I wanna focus on one of the things that the paper points out that is traditional, that is that traditionally we have emphasized and I'll actually say overemphasized um, when making appointments into leadership roles, research prominence, instead of also leadership skills. Um, there is weight, um, there is some weight put on whether a person has Senate service, whether they understand the university systems, especially the personnel review process, but a person that, it is, that is a distinguished and highly accomplished scientist as measured by traditional metrics, publications, grant dollars, stature in their discipline, accomplished record of service, is not necessarily a person with equity-minded leadership skills. They are not necessarily a person who knows how to build consensus, how to empower students, staff, and faculty, how to encourage grassroots efforts. So it, in, in, in our system, right, in, in academia in general, the departments are the most coherent and autonomous units. The department culture and climate has the largest impact on our daily lives. So the department chairs are one of the most important leaders. And the dean appoints and selects the chairs, and the dean gets to decide which what criteria to use. So, in talking to Paul about this, who wasn't able to be here today, um, Paul Koch, we did we agree that the dean needs to be intentional about picking chairs that have a demonstrated ability to build community, build consensus, and strategically promote DEI. They need to be active listeners. They themselves need to be people that are doing their own personal work and acknowledge that they are works in progress. They need to set the tone and are the role models for the other faculty in the department. So the, the, the selection of the chairs is, is super important, I think, for leadership, um, for um, leadership to, to, to promote and, 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 um, and be part of this transformation that we're talking about. Um, so the dean, him, the dean him or herself needs to have transformation and dismantling whiteness as a top priority, and the chairs need to have, need to be his or her allies and partners in fulfilling that agenda. Okay, the second um, recommendation in the paper was the need for a racially just approach that intentionally includes voices and representation of faculty of color within decision making processes. In other words, how does equity-minded leadership happen in a system that is by, by its very nature and structure um, a bureaucratic hierarchy? Um, so this means intentionally making space for and amplifying voices of faculty of color. Okay, uh, the Dean has done this first by appointing me because um, it is a top priority for him and he's got his plate full and he doesn't have the bandwidth and he listens to me as a person of color with different lived experiences than him. And I have a chair, I'm, I mean, I have a committee. I chair a committee with representation from faculty, staff, and students. So I listen to them. So there's this um, listening and working with um, uh, on amplifying and giving space for people of color that's really necessary. Um, so I personally talk with faculty of color in PBSI, and if they need support, I bring this to the attention of the Dean. We problem solve behind the scenes and figure out how to support and retain faculty of color and early career faculty. I personally talk with department chairs, hoping to foster a trusting relationship with them. This means that we can hold each other accountable. I make myself available for hearing about inequities and problems to inform my own holistic understanding of our climate and culture in the division and to help solve problems behind the scenes. And um, like, like Celine said, there are a lot, there are a lot of pent up, there's a lot of pent up hurt and pain that people have not been able to express to a person in a leadership role before. 
And so I regularly meet with students of color and faculty of color to hear their concerns. And I use those, that information and that understanding when I make recommendations to the Dean. I've been involved in mediating disputes between people, helping faculty navigate the system, the reporting system, the personnel system. Um, but there are lots of situations I don't have the bandwidth to address. I'm grateful that we'll soon have equity advocates. And in PDSI, we've talked about adding equity ambassadors that are more student and staff focused. Um, another way that we have um, intentionally amplified the voices of faculty of color is that we ran a STEM faculty survey that focused on climate and also on fa how faculty feel about their own and other DEI work going on in the division. This is to help us help guide us on how to better reward and recognize DEI work, how to make invisible work visible and appreciate it as high impact work. We're also developing affinity groups within the division, not only for creating safe space for faculty of color, early career faculty and graduate students, but also as a way of, to empower them by asking them to talk, inviting them to talk with PBC leadership, PBCI leadership about their concerns and suggested solutions and making sure we hear them and take action. Uh, the third recommendation in the paper was empowering grassroots efforts. So we have DEI champions on this campus and in our division, individuals who have initiated and created amazing research and other types of programs that support diverse students, create an inclusive community, and we need to better support these efforts. Many faculty are doing this work as a labor of love, in many cases at the expense of their own research productivity and the rewards that go along with that. So, um, so it's, I think it's really important to elevate and recognize that could be through the personnel reviews, uh, providing course releases and other kinds of substantive support and through acknowledgement and celebration of the achievements, important, it's really important to publicly acknowledge these grassroots efforts and the people behind them. And then the fourth thing is to value and reward leadership efforts of faculty of color. And this is tied a lot to the personnel review process. Um, so we need guidelines about how to recognize DEI efforts and leadership in the personnel review process, I don't think. I mean, we did, a, we did the survey asking faculty if they had an understanding about how to do this, and they, they really don't. Um, so we're working also we're working on guidelines for that. We're working on a teaching workload policy that is equitable and recognizes the implementation of inclusive teaching practices and mentoring practices. And, and, and then the other side of the personnel review process, I think that's important is that we need to acknowledge that traditional metrics that we've been using are problematic and biased. And so we have to de-emphasize them and find different ways to do our evaluation. We know there's bias in who gets selected to give talks at conferences, citation rates, funding decisions, authorship order, letters of recommendation, what is perceived as being high impact service, there's bias in that. So faculty evaluate each other and we need to elevate their awareness of those biases. And then um, my own opinion is that we have to get away from the three bucket model that we have learned to evaluate each other with, which tends to devalue service and leadership. The UCSC mission is multifaceted and we need a model that reflects that. We thus need to broaden our definition of research and reward those with outstanding contributions in serving and teaching, including those contributions that promote equity and inclusion. DEI work is difficult. It takes a huge emotional toll on faculty of color and it has largely been invisible. If we're asking even more of faculty, asking them to step up to meet the challenges of being a minority serving institution, like increasing student success, closing equity gaps, transforming the institution, even if we in intentionally reward DEI work, we cannot continue to add things to, to our plates without taking something off. So this involves broadening our perspective and how we interpret the APM. Um, and then just a little plug for my a, a personal, this is just my own personal opinion. It's not, doesn't, it's not, it's not the, the dean's 
opinion, it's just mine, is that I think we need to rethink the special salary practice. Underpaid junior or like early career faculty, underpaid relative to the cost of living, are incentivized by the special salary practice to be overachievers in all three areas just to get a reasonable growth in their off-scale increments. This is a recipe for burnout, especially for faculty for minoritized groups that are also coping with bias. I see faculty of color and graduate students of color feeling like this lifestyle is not sustainable for them. We need an off-scale salary structure and policy that does not result in burnout and attrition. So that's just, that's just something, I'm, that's just a plug that I'm making. That's just my own personal opinion. I know it's controversial, but I'm just gonna put it out there. So those are the um, just, just a, a few comments that address the like the four recommendations that were made at the end of um, at the end of the paper. Thanks. Thanks. I believe it's uh, my turn now. Um, Alex Wolf, and I'm uh, dean of the Baston School of Engineering. Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems of going last, of course, is that I've taken a whole bunch more notes but I want to share with you things. And of course, I'm also probably holding up a lot of people's lunches, and I recognize that, um, including my own, by the way. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank Rebecca and Catherine for their very important, careful work, um, Christine for hosting, uh, and the campus as a whole for engaging in this really critical conversation. And so I appreciate this opportunity to, to make a number of points in the limited time that I have. Um, the first uh, point is on the nature of engineering. Uh, engineering is about meeting societal challenges through technical innovation. And that's both solving problems and seizing on new opportunities. It's inherently community engaged because the success in engineering comes through broad use of technology. And that means being highly sensitive to a broad and diverse population. It's inherently collaborative most engineering solutions require deep technical knowledge and skills coming from a wide variety of disciplines and perspectives, as well as a deep understanding of the community of use. And it's inherently creative. So it sits in this interesting space between science and the arts, um, where, we, we, where there is methodical creativity, um, rigorous design. And these are kind of oxymoronic concepts in some sense. Second point, it's important to acknowledge that engineering as a profession and as a school of intellectual thought has a history of exclusion. And like many intellectual disciplines, its value system was defined by privileged white men. For engineering, this is prim primarily in Western Europe and the US during the 19th century, and primarily to support the narrow needs of the industrial revolution which you can interpret as meaning enriching more white men. Since that time, engineering has grown to become a foundational element of modern society, touching upon in one way or another nearly every aspect of our lives. So engineering is now uh, focused as much on societal good as it is on anything else. So from fighting illness and disease to reducing mundane or dangerous labor, to democratizing access to information, to mitigating the effects of climate change. But its legacy in white male dominated culture survives today and its structures reinforce that legacy. So it continues to be a competitive meritocracy. It's a well-documented bro culture. Um, and despite a strong tradition of community engaged user-centered design, engineering solutions and innovations are often actually centered around the individual engineer's own lived experiences. So when the white male engineer or the white male dominated engineering team innovates, it often leaves out, leaves out the needs and desires of women and people of color. Third point, um, the engineering profession is committed to change. So our failings are really well known and well documented. Uh, government funding agencies and our professional societies are dedicating incredible amounts of effort to broadening participation in engineering. Why? Because it results in better engineering and better technology, but also because it's, it's just right and just. Change, however, is coming excruciatingly slowly, and it's a topic of concern 
um, for at least, it's been a topic of concern for at least as long as I've been in the profession. So that's about 35 years. So the bottom line is it's well known, well documented, but still not well understood. And I think that's where the work of Rebecca and Catherine can make an important contribution. Fourth point, um, historically, I think we have gotten our efforts backwards. So we have assumed, we've assumed that in order to achieve a more inclusive, equitable discipline, that our efforts should be focused exclusively on helping people prepare to succeed within the existing structures. So for example, our pipeline programs or transition programs, remediation programs for students or leadership training for faculty. These are good things in principle, but what's the implicit message here? That they, the historically excluded, must be trained to perform in and conform to dis disciplinary norms and expectations set largely by privileged white people in the 19th century and continuing today. So instead, we could be asking, how should the institution change to welcome the various norms and expectations of a truly diverse community? And I found it very affirming that I saw a similar thread of thought in, the Rebecca, in Rebecca and Catherine's work. So what are we doing in Baskin Engineering? Point five, first some facts, percentage of students of color and faculty color is comparable. It's about 70%. Percentage of Latinx students and faculty is also comparable, about 18%. Percentage of Black and Indigenous students and faculty is comparable, but it's maybe 1%. These numbers are by and large typical for engineering schools, which is not meant to be any kind of excuse, but rather meant to be an observation that this is a systemic challenge faced broadly across the US. It does point up the fact that as engineering schools, particularly private universities, the private universities awake to this challenge, the competition for a genuine diverse, diverse, um, for genuinely diverse, genuine diversity of talent from a painfully small pool has become fierce. Okay, so one more piece of data, percentage of people of color in leadership roles in our engineering school is misaligned with the school as a whole. So the percentage of faculty administrators in our school were faculty of color, it's about 10%. Percentage of senior faculty who are people of color, I'm uh, sorry, senior staff who are people of color is about 10%. So we have begun asking the question, what does it mean to be a school of engineering that is intentionally anti-exclusionary? What does it mean? In the, in the formation of the school and in our practices, procedures, and attitude. So this means being anti-racist, anti-genderist, -gender, anti-phobic, anti-ableist, anti-casteist. This question is intended to get the very mechanisms and structures that inhibit diversity. Diversity in that sense is not the focus, but rather the outcome born of successful anti-exclusionary practices. So, Frankly, today, we don't know the answer to that question. What does it mean to be an anti-racist school of engineering? But we do know that when we do find an answer, we could be a model for engineering schools across the nation with impact that goes far beyond UCSC and even beyond academia itself. Concretely, um, what are we doing? But focusing only on the faculty for the purposes of this gathering, we're continuing and self-funding the advancing divert faculty diversity experiment, and I characterize it as an experiment, um, which uses a standardized rubric-based scheme to help train search committees to screen faculty applicants first based on diversity statements. We are very engaged with the PPFH and Chancellor's version of that program. Um, last year, we hosted the first UC-wide PPF STEM conference to highlight the achievements of those incredible young scholars. We're actively engaged in and contributing leadership in the Equity Advocates Program, uh, led out of the BPAA's office and the Sea Change Initiative. We're requiring statements of contributions to diversity as part of personnel and departmental merit and promotion review letters, both, so, both at the personal level and at the department level, which is intended to surface and reward otherwise invisible labor. Um, Several years ago, we created the first division-wide council of faculty and staff to examine equity and diversity practices in the school. 
Uh, and we're now recruiting for an associate dean to provide faculty leadership for our inclusion efforts and collaboration with our staff with the aim of empowering faculty to bring anti-exclusionary practices to their research, educational, and service efforts. We're helping faculty criti critically examine and evolve their approach to pedagogy through our BICEP, which stands for Baskin Engineering Inclusive Curriculum and Engineering Pedagogy Initiative. Um, and we're taking seriously our role in contributing through graduate education to the diversity of the professoriate. So let me close by saying that I believe that meaningful and substantive change is happening within the Engineering Academy. I've been in the profession for 35 years, and I can tell you the people in the room are indeed changing. Um, the people with voices are broadening. We're a work in progress, but I'm extremely pleased with what I've seen as a fundamental shift from tacit engagement to active redesign. I also wanna say what a privilege it is to be in, in company with a set of deans who are so strongly committed to the cause and collaborative in finding solutions. We lean on each other and we learn from each other. And this cohesiveness is something that is typically not true in other universities. Hierarchy is not in and of itself problematic unless the goals and values of those higher in the hierarchy are not in alignment with those lower. That alignment is something that needs constant tending. And I believe that this event is part of that important work. So thank you. You know, thank you so much um, to all the deans and the representatives from the divisional dean's offices for your um, presentations. You know, um, we're especially appreciative when you um, explicitly address the findings of um, Becca and Kat's report. And, you know, I'm wondering, I, I know that we do not have a lot of time for q and I want to note, too, that Chancellor Larive has stayed until the very end of this. We are deeply appreciative that you have. Um, but I wanted to mention a few things that might anticipate our conversation on May 6th, which will be the final event. It will not be May 13th. It will be on the 6th of May. Um, which is recognizing invisible labor in the university ways forward. I want to announce that we have someone who is coming from UCLA. Um, that's Margaret She, And we have someone coming from Berkeley, uh, Emily Ozer. And we also have the head of CAP, Stefano Profumo. Shante Larkins will be speaking about uh, faculty of color. And it will be a conversation about invisible labor with recommendations. And I hope that we can take some of the recommendations that you have furnished us with um, as a way of furthering this conversation. I hope that many of you will be there too. I would like to give uh, Becca and Kat a chance to respond to this, but I wanted to say something um, just to synthesize some of the things that I was hearing. I wonder um, if, it's not possible to take what, for example, Christine Ravella was speaking about how we have to rethink the sort of um, traditional three bucket model that tends to devalue service. It would be really important for us to think about alternatives to this. There are some South African universities that in addition to research, teaching and service and almost all DI work, even though it's supposed to be in all three categories, gets sort of demoted and lumped into service. But there are some South African universities that have another category of community engagement. It's just an idea. Another sort of option, and this is something that Krez has broached with Stefano Profumo, you know, we have the contributions uh, to diversity and different departments um, approach this differently. I have seen that category gained. When it's across the board and everyone does it, then there's a way to find other people find a way to ensure that, you know, they also have a statement that seems like something when it might just be puffed up, right? And so what if, we, how can we rethink that? The contributions to diversity, I would argue, is a broken category. And, um, you know, would it make sense for CAP, which I believe has 13 people, to have not one person who could be tokenized or that person could be, it, 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 it could be subjected to the whims of personality, but what if there's a team of people that are charged with DEI oversight? 
on cat? Like, what about that as a possible idea? I think that we need to be able to start thinking structurally. Um, on the level of like the equity advisors, it's so much for the people like uh, Christina, like Judith, like, you know, people who are tasked with that to do so much work within your respective divisions. How can we shift the burden and the responsibility, not even burden, forgive me for even saying that, but the responsibility to the departmental level. Celine, I know that in the arts, you have given prompts, down, you've drilled down to the unit level. What if there are prompts for self-evaluation and you know, ways so that equity advisors are met more than halfway by departments? And what if the equity advisors had a council where they could meet together so there's some way of being able to centralize information that is coming in and a way to assess structural patterns that are at play. What if there are surveys that are conducted in each division? We have requested, CRJ requested from APO an intersectional equity analysis that breaks down tenure, promotion, and salary according to race, gender, and academic position, including lecturers. But APO is understaffed and unable to furnish us with that equity analysis. I think that we need that. Um, but let me go ahead and um, turn things over to Becca and Kat. I know that we're running out of time. Yeah, I think rather than sort of rushing through like all the thoughts that I'm having and also sort of, I just wanna say like emotional reactions too. Like Christine, I'm just very moved by like the very concrete ways that you laid out um, not only the pain of all the sort of emotional work done, but also concrete ways of like thinking about ways of moving forward and an ask to be very visionary, I think, in this work. Um, I appreciate that we have a third event coming that um, that has a more, I think, the goal of a more concrete conversation about actions and resistance to some of those structural changes. Um, I also will say that um, I think without those concrete, um, very structural um, kind of unified way of thinking about reimagining what these structures can look like. We still leave it on the labor of faculty of color to then engage in um, what, you know, Gina Lancat and her work shows is everyday resistance. So Kat has a separate paper that talks about the everyday resistance of faculty of color from the same set of interviews. Um, and a lot of that ranges from self-care to just walking out and feeling burnt out by that. So um, rather than sort of respond to some of these structural things, I think Christine, I'm on, you know, I'm, uh, I'm reflecting very deeply on the things that you just proposed, but there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but I just want to say thank you for advocating for putting this event together, because I think conversations like these are an essential, not only starting point, but also continuation of a lot of efforts that, you know, folks have already been doing, but I'm looking forward to that third conversation where we can, um, I mean, really, I think, imagine this. One of the most frustrating questions that I get in some of this work is that, well, what is a new system? It's like, I don't think it's my job to bring that up or think about that, but I think it's a collective endeavor that takes a lot of brilliance and creativity and resources and investment and time. Um, and I know those are things that um, we're sort of restricted by and restrained by sometimes, but I'm glad that we have a space to try to think about what that looks like. And I hope it's not disproportionately um, faculty of color and other marginalized groups that have to do that thought work, but thank you very much. Yes, and you know, I, I see that Cynthia Lewis placed in the chat that several speakers um, addressed the necessity of broadening what counts as research. And, you know, I mean, we do need to have a conversation about that. You know, I mean, at, when CRES departmentalized, we had an appendix that <laughs> broadened what counts as research. And we were advised by CAP, put that up every single time. But this is a conversation to be continued. And I hope that it will be possible, you know, um, you know, it, it, CRJ is happy to organize this kind of space. It's hard to get everyone's schedule <laughs> aligned, but you know, perhaps this is a kind of conversation that we can return to annually. You know, and maybe it makes sense to do this annually um, because I certainly don't want to drop the ball on any of this, and I welcome this being a continued um, priority. For, for our campus. I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to have a robust Q&A. Um, I hope that you will all be able to attend our third event. It will be at lunchtime um, on Friday, May 6th. Um, and we look forward to being able to see you all there. And I just wanted to thank again, you know, Becca and Kat, you know, I want to thank, you know, all the members of the planning team, but really the, the deans and the people, um, representatives from the dean's office, um, offices who 
offered um, a lot of insight into both what you're doing, but also reckoned with hard truths about what work remains to be done. And you know, I'm reminded of what some of our colleagues have said at UCLA, recognition is the first step that we have to get beyond that. So, you know, I hope that we can move together toward material solutions to these structural problems. Thank you all so much.